1938, an Irish woman living in Brussels by the name of Mrs Muriel Bennington wrote to the Department of Foreign Affairs in Dublin and asked if her Jewish contacts could obtain guaranteed citizenship by the Irish Free State if they invested massively into the Irish economy. They are willing to pay in your hands pounds sterling 100 each to be used by you for any charity requiring help. Besides, they will bring into the country capital and new industries and give work to a certain number of unemployed. The export of Ireland will certainly increase tremendously. However, despite this financial reassurance, on February 15th, 1939, Frederick Boland replied, The only refugees who are admitted to this country are persons whose cases are recommended to the Minister by the Irish Coordinating Committee for Refugees. And with that, neither Mrs Bennington nor her Jewish contacts were admitted to the safety of Ireland. Anti-Semitism in the Free State's socio-political sphere between the years 1918 to 1939 was maintained by certain members in high-ranking public offices. Men, such as Adolf Maher, who at one time was the director of the National Museum of Ireland, or Charles Bewley, the Irish envoy to Berlin during the interwar period. The collaborative efforts of these men, and figures that will be later alluded to, reap serious effects on the Jewish community. The influence these bureaucrats had on the Free State's policies is an important factor that will be expanded upon in later paragraphs. Additionally, highlighted is the nonchalant attitude held in regards to these corrupt and racist politicians by Dáil Éireann. The role and flamboyant nature played by the Nazi party in Dublin is shown to represent the relaxed attitude held towards Irish anti-Semites. The effect that all of these racist social and political figures had on Irish governmental decisions and more importantly, on the Irish-Jewish community, culminated in Ireland's response to the Jewish refugee crisis. As will be contended, Ireland, due to its geographic location and stance of neutrality, could have played a pivotal role in saving exiled Jews. However, due to the Free State's relaxed attitudes toward anti-Semitic corruption within its own government, its role was largely insignificant. One of the most important faces of Irish diplomatic relations in Berlin during the 1930s was Charles Bewley. However, underneath his gentry accent and educated background lay a person filled with anti-Semitic hatreds and xenophobic ideologies. Bewley's stay in Berlin was littered with acts of racist behaviour and support for Adolf Hitler's schemes of ethnic cleansing. Furthermore, Bewley's reports to Dublin from Berlin reveal a deeper insight into the envoy's racist attitudes. In a letter dated 1922 from Bewley to Dublin, he apologises for his comments regarding Robert Briscoe when he stated, It is not likely a Jew of his type will be appointed into the Irish consul. However, his reputation in Germany becomes much more controversial. While in a Jewish-owned music hall, Bewley became heavily intoxicated and began an anti-Semitic rant so profane that he was removed and subsequently barred from entering again. In his reports to Dublin, he discusses, in a favourable tone, the atrocities committed onto the Jews, and quote, enthusiastic support for the great majority of the ordinary people. Evidently, Bewley was in favour of the punishments that Jews were subjected to. Katrina Goldstone argues that his actions during the Irish visa vetting process and associations with the Third Reich during the war almost led to him receiving a death sentence. To many of his contemporaries, such as Jean Chartres, they held high regards for him, despite knowing he was, quote, mad on the Jewish question. Though Bewley's actions were unquestionably absurd, he was not unique within the Irish political spectrum. Other prominent political figures voiced, or acted on, their hatred for the Jews. However, it is important to note the milieu of society at this time. Anti-Semitism was existent even during the formation of the Irish state. Arthur Griffith, considered one of Ireland's founding fathers, on numerous occasions voiced his hatred for the Jews. Likewise, J.J. O'Kelly, who filled Eamon de Valera's position as president of Sinn Féin in 1927, declared during his first presidential address, In the designs of the Antichrist, England is today the prey of rival groups of unscrupulous Jews who fight for their own hands. Furthermore, in Berlin, during the early 1930s, Irish ambassadors, such as Leo T. Macaulay, reported on the unjust punishment towards Jews to Dublin, explaining that, quote, To some extent, the Jews brought this trouble on themselves. However, arguably the most infamous anti-Semite among these politicians was Oliver J. Flanagan, 
a successful politician and a member of Fine Gael, Flanagan was very direct in his hatred towards the Jewish race. In 1943, during a Dáil debate, he vehemently expressed, How is it that we do not see any of these acts directed against the Jews, who crucified our saviour 1900 years ago, who are crucifying us every day of the week? There is one thing that Germany did, and that was rout the Jews out of their country. Until we rout the Jews out of this country, it does not matter what orders we make. Where the bees are, there is honey, and where the Jews are, there is money. This racist rant was simply brushed off by Flanagan's peers. He was not interrupted once, nor was a comment passed. Moreover, figures of a similar nature also existed in the civil service. A small number of civil servants in Sershot Aram held anti-Semitic views. One of the most notable figures was the former commissioner of the Garda Síochána, Ono Duffy. While his affinity to the Nazi party is somewhat contested, Historians such as Dermot Kyo argue that he was sympathetic to the ideologies promoted by the Third Reich. O'Duffy's blue shirt movement was threatening to the Jewish community, and they sparked nationwide concerns over their fascist principles. Perhaps more startling, however, is the civil servants who paradoxically held allegiance to the Free State, but supported the Third Reich. The NSDAP, or simply the Nazi Party, operated in Dublin with roughly 100 members and was run by German nationals working as civil servants in Ireland. The Nazi party in Ireland operated just like any other party. They had Christmas parties in the Gresham Hotel and had other social events in Delir Street, Red Bank Restaurant or Kilmacurra Park Hotel in Wicklow. High-ranking members of the party included the previously mentioned Adolf Mayer, Friedrich Herkner, Professor of Sculpture in the National College of Art, Dublin in 1938, Otto Reinhardt, Head of Forestry in the Department of Lands, Friedrich Weckler, Chief of the ESB, and Helmut Klissmann, who ran the German Academic Exchange Programme during the 1930s. Furthermore, Maher was appointed the Director of the Museum by Eamon de Valera in 1934, while simultaneously leading the NSDAP's Dublin chapter from 1934 to 1939. The arguments surrounding the government's knowledge pertaining to the political agenda of these men's lives is under some debate. David O'Donoghue argues that de Valera may not have known this information. However, military intelligence at the time was fully aware of the sympathetic nature these men held toward the Nazi party. Accepting the fact that there certainly was anti-Semites within the organs of the state, the people who knew these men were on the payroll may have simply remained silent. On a broader scale, the level of influence from the people mentioned certainly had an impact on society. Dahl debates, from the early formation of the Free State to the conclusion of World War II, gives one an insight into the issues the Jewish population were facing and how the government dealt with these concerns. The various pogroms that occurred around the country in the early 1920s were brought up in the Dahl in November 1923. Donald McCarthy asks, Is there any special precaution being taken to protect Jewish citizens from further attacks? Kevin O'Higgins responds by stating, Sectarian crime has not within living memory manifested itself in Dublin, and I do not believe that we are now faced with anything so horrible. O'Higgins evidently refused to believe there existed a link between anti-Semitism and the event aforementioned. Perhaps more remarkable than this is a debate in 1945 between James Dillon and Gerard Boland, then Minister for Justice, regarding the intimidation of Jewish citizens in Dublin. Dillon asks if... Boland was aware that threatening letters by an organised body have been delivered to several Jewish residents in Dublin. However, Boland simply denies that such incidents even occurred and refuses to answer, ending the debate by saying, quote, I could answer, but I am sick of that sort of nonsense. The reactions from both Gerard Boland and Kevin O'Higgins when confronted with these issues represents the sluggish response from Dáil Éireann to deal with anti-Semitism in the Irish public. The Jews themselves were beginning to feel more animosity from the nation towards their people in Ireland as the competition in the labour market began to rise. Moreover, as David Hannigan argues, the Irish government was growing more concerned as the Jewish people did not seem to be assimilating into Irish society. The mounting anti-Semitic tension in Ireland is arguably best portrayed by the Irish government's response to the Jewish refugee crisis of the 1930s and 40s. In 1938, the Nazis took Vienna, further escalating the refugee crisis, and in response, President Franklin D. Roosevelt 
called a conference at Evian Le Bon. The 32 countries attended, the response regarding the crisis was met with little compassion, as many states argued that they suffered from unemployment and economic hardship. Ireland was no different in this matter, as they could, quote, make no real contribution either. And indeed, this assertion was correct, as out of 430,000 Jews which emigrated from Greater Germany between 1933 and 1940, Ireland only took approximately 300. Moreover, comparing this number to the smaller, neutral Switzerland that took in 8,000 Jews, one begins to understand how little of a contribution Ireland made to the refugee crisis. The government imposed strict visa application requirements which greatly reduced the number of immigrants coming into Ireland, and during the war these became even more severe. Further exasperating this, the war years in combination with the Free State's location and neutrality vastly increased the amount of visa applicants wishing to come to Ireland. Moreover, when war started, Hitler made it policy that refugees could only immigrate to neutral countries. Ireland's response to this was to maintain strict requirements for visa applications. When the Nazi party removed the Jews from the Third Reich, they also removed their citizenship, making them stateless. Thus, the process of gaining a visa to Ireland became ever more cumbersome for those of the Jewish faith. Another requirement for getting a visa was the ability to prove that you could support yourself and not become reliant on the state for financial assistance. However, when analysing the accounts of Jews who applied for visas, it is obvious that even despite holding this proof, they may still have been refused. As previously mentioned, the case of Mrs. Bennington in 1938 highlights this issue, as even despite the guarantee of financial independence, her Jewish associates were still not admitted to the country. It is uncertain what exactly happened to her. However, it is likely she, and indeed the people she speaks of, suffered the same fate as most Jewish communities in Brussels. Evidently, there existed a certain prejudice towards Jews in the visa application process. Furthermore, Katrina Goldstone argues that while many of these applicants perfectly filled the requirements for a visa, it was ultimately their faith that stood in their way. Sean Murphy, writing to Art O'Brien, states that requirements for Irish visas are based on the condition that, quote, the applicant is not of Jewish or partly Jewish origins. Though the practice of gaining a visa did not request information about religion, they in fact furthered this prejudice as department officers would often guess the religion of the applicant based on their name. In August 1938, Con Kremen wrote to External Affairs in discussion of an application from one Dr. Gutman, stating, I would say from his appearance and from his name that Dr. Gutman is a Jew. In view of the instructions we have received from the department to the effect that Jewish refugees from Germany will be excluded from Ireland, I informed him that I considered that there was very little chance, if any, that he would be granted a visa for Ireland. Evidently, there was anti-Semitism within the applications department. The same type of prejudice can be seen in Berlin, where Bewley made huge strides to interrupt the application process of Jewish visas with the hopes that they would not receive them. On reflection, the Free State's contribution to the Jewish refugee crisis was greatly impeded by anti-Semitic policies and overall woefully inadequate compared to other countries, such as Switzerland. The refugee crisis itself is not the main issue dealt with, but it contributes to the larger picture of anti-Semitism in the Irish politics of the day. However, the mere existence of these characters is not the major issue of concern, but more the fact that their outspoken views were tolerated by not only their peers, but the Irish Free State. The broader implications of this eventually culminated into having deep effects on the Jewish population both in Europe and Ireland. While the quantity of anti-Semitic persons holding public offices is certainly debatable, what is undeniable, however, is the impact even this small number of people had on the international Jewish community, both within Ireland and those attempting to gain entry. Growing anti-Semitism in Ireland was excited by economic hardship, subsequent unemployment and the increase of Jewish immigrants. These issues certainly contributed to the decision made by Irish politicians towards Jewish immigration policies. Overall, what one can garner from this turbulent period is that a combination of anti-Semitism, poverty and a tolerance towards xenophobia all contributed to an Irish political sphere which had calamitous effects on the Jewish population subject to the Irish Free State.